I'm Dylan, I'm a PhD student um, in the Cork Institute of Technology in Ireland and today I'll be talking about exploring pitfalls in soft fine networking implementation. So what I'll be running through during this presentation is just a quick introduction to SDN and how SDN works. Um, I'll then be looking at what functionality we can exploit. So I say functionality because modern soft fine networks aren't just susceptible to known generic threats or known software issues, but what we wanted to prove with this work is that they're also susceptible to threats um, due to the way the functionality in the network is actually performed. Um, so we'll see that a bit later on. And I'll then be going on to um, present some new attacks based off exploiting this functionality. So I'll be um, looking at a new method of forming arc cache volume, which can be extended to form a man in the middle attack, a port scan capable of bypassing certain security rules, and as well as that, a distributed denial service attack. So a nice mix of different types of attacks. And then I'll be finally finishing up. So SDN, why is it? Well, in SDN, control is centralized to a device known as a controller. So it's the controller's job to make forwarding decisions for traffic in the network. So the forwarding devices in the network will forward traffic based on how the controller instructs them to do it. So the way this works is that each forwarding device contains flow tables, and these flow tables contain <coughs> flow entries. So when the packet arrives at a forwarding device, the forwarding device will look at details in that packet, and it will then attempt to match that packet um, with matching criteria in a, in a flow entry. And if it can successfully match a packet with a flow entry, it will then perform an action on that packet. And these actions are specified in the flow entries. And these actions could be something along the lines of output port 1 or drop. Now, if a forwarding device receives a packet, but it cannot match that packet with an existing flow entry, it will forward that packet to the controller. So the controller will receive this packet, it will look at where that packet needs to go. It will then make a forwarding decision for the packet, so it will decide on route through the network that that packet should take. It will then install flow entries on each forwarding device along that route, which will then allow the packet to traverse the network. Now, if a controller receives a packet destined for a host whose location has not yet been learned, um, so the way that so the controller needs to actually understand the, the locations of hosts in the network. So generally, this is done by having the controller passively observe traffic in the network, but. Like I was saying, if the controller receives a packet destined for a host whose location is not known, um, what a lot of controllers would actually do is flood that packet throughout the entire network um, with the expectation that the correct host will receive it and then respond allowing its location to be learned. So that's a very quick introduction to SDN, um, but that should give you a nice baseline for what I'm about to talk to you, or talk to you about. So what, actually, what functionality here can we actually exploit? Well, imprecise flow entries um, are flow entries which only use partial matching criteria. So these types of flow entries could allow an attacker to spoof certain packet details and have their packets piggyback on an existing flow. So this is an issue because any piggybacked packets will then never be sent to the controller, so the controller can never observe these packets. And as well as this, the flooding of packets bound for hosts whose location is not known, um, this can essentially allow a host to receive a packet from another host indirectly, even if security rules exist, to prevent direct communication between those hosts. So the first attack I'm going to be presenting today is the data plane ARP cache poisoning attack. So the goal of this attack is to allow the attacker to perform ARP cache poisoning against another host in the network without the controller actually um, observing the attack. So this is an interesting attack because most security mechanisms in SDN would be implemented in the controller, because the controller is expected to observe every bit of traffic that flows through the network. Um, and if an attacker is able to perform an ARP cache poisoning attack against another to against a target in the network without the controller observing it, um, the, con the attacker can then essentially avoid any security mechanisms built into the controller to prevent ARP spoofing attacks from, from occurring. Um, and with um, many ARP cache poisoning attacks, this can easily be extended to form a man in the middle attack. So, the way this attack works is that the attacker sends a genuine gratuitous ARP reply to the victim. So what will happen here is the attacker will send this packet, the packet will reach the forwarding device. The forwarding device will forward the packet to the controller because there is no existing flow in the network. The controller will then install the flow in the network which will allow the packet to reverse the network and reach the target. The attacker will now craft a second gratuitous ARP reply. Now what the attacker will now do is they'll modify the ARP header, so they'll modify the source IP and source hardware address in the ARP header, the same way you do with generic ARP cache poisoning. Um, and the attacker sends this packet. Now this packet is then able to piggyback on the flow which was put in place for the original um, gratuitous ARP reply. So this packet is able to piggyback on this flow and this can then reach the victim and poison its ARP cache. And as you can see, 
um, this the malicious tablet, the second malicious gratuitous error, never actually reaches the controller because of the piggybacking. So the phantom host scan builds on this attack slightly. So the, fan, the goal of the phantom host scan is to allow the attacker to perform port scanning of a target, even if certain security rules are in place. So this then allows the attacker to perform port scan on a protected host um, and essentially diminish the effectiveness of any firewall or access control rules which are in place. So the way this attack works is that the attacker will first perform the data plane app crash poisoning attack against the victim host. Now what the attacker will aim to do here is poison an entry in the victim's app cache and insert a MAC address which isn't actually in use in the network. So by doing this, the attacker creates an IP and MAC address pair in the victim's app cache which doesn't actually correspond to a host in the network. So this then is the phantom host. Um, so we, when we tested this attack, we implemented it using a TCP SYN scan. So for those who are not familiar with TCP SYN scan, the idea is that you send a TCP SYN to a target for a certain port and you will get back a TCP SYN app if the port is open or TCP reset if the port is closed. So the attacker will now send a TCP SYN to the victim. Now the attacker will spoof the source IP of this packet as the IP address of the phantom host or the IP address of the um, poison the app cache entry in the victim host. So this packet will reach the forwarding device, the forwarding device will send it to the controller. The controller will then install the flow in the network to allow the packet to traverse the network and it will then reach the victim host. So like I was saying, the victim will now respond with either a SYNAC or RESET, depending on whether or not the port is open. But the victim is going to be responding to the source IP which was used in the packet, which is the source IP of the phantom host. So when the victim responds, they will be using the details in the poison air patch entry. So the victim will respond with the destination details of being the phantom host. Um, the control, the, this packet will reach the forwarding device and will then be forwarded to the controller by the forwarding device. So the controller will not be able to make a forwarding decision for this packet because of the fact that this is destined for the phantom host and the phantom host, like I said, doesn't actually exist in the network. So the controller will flood the packet throughout the network and the attacker simply observes this flooded packet and can then understand the status of the port. Now, where the, um, the mechanism of bypassing certain security rules comes into play here is that during this attack, the attacker never actually uses their IP address. So their IP address isn't used for the source IP or the destination IP for any of the packets here. So if any security rules, an access control rule or a firewall rule exists in the network which specifies the attacker's IP address, they won't be triggered. Um, and as well as that, the packet which is returned to the, to, the, to the attacker, which the attacker uses to understand the status of the port, um, this packet is destined for a host which doesn't actually exist in the network. So there's also a good chance that that will therefore not trigger any security rules as well. <coughs>